Okay. Can you hear me well? I'm um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Max Larin. I'm CEO of Ximea, and today I would like to tell you some words about our new product line, which is uh, miniature hyperspectral cameras. Uh, that uh, thing was become possible because of the cooperation between our company and uh, iMac. So iMac is uh, one of the famous and world leading centers in non-electronics located in Belgium. And few words about ourselves. So we are for 25 years making cameras for different application areas and starting from scientific and all the way to machine vision and industrial. So uh, hyperspectral imaging. What is all about? So for those who already know, so you will need to manage to hear that again. For those who are first time, so I hope that it will be useful. So uh, hyperspectral imaging is a combination of uh, imaging and spectroscopy. So what that effectively means? For imaging, we, for each pixel, we have its value, whether it is uh, grayscale or whether it is red, green, blue components or any other color coordinates for hyperspectral imaging, each pixel prints the full spectrum. So there are more, va more than just a few values. That. And uh, what uh, these data represents, it represents the irradiance of the scene which the camera is looking at. So what is the data itself? It's not a just 2D data set. Rather, it is a three-dimensional thing. So where we have two spatial coordinates, X and Y, similar to any other imaging device. But then we have a third coordinate, which is lambda, which is a wavelength. Effectively, this is a cube where each layer, so to say, represents one particular wavelength. And the value at that particular layer represents the irradiance of the scene. So where it is used today, and what are the possible applications for hyperspectral imaging? So it's uh, extremely wide. So where the regular imaging is not really able or capable to deliver the information sufficient for make a wise decision on the object or objects. So then the hyperspectral imaging can help. And this goes for medical imaging, where you can detect the changes on the skin uh, reflectance and by that identify diseases in the very early stage. That is uh, microscopy, endoscopy, which is uh, quite traditional for that area. Uh, precision agriculture, where you can monitor your field and make, again, so wise decision whether water is needed for the field or not. That is uh, remote sensing, which is, was actually the one, no, it that was the first application for hyperspectral imaging, uh, mineralogy, and so on. So we can name a lot of application where the use of hyperspectral imaging brings an advantage. So what is effectively we can get out of that? We can see something what was invisible before. So on a grayscale, we have just a few grayscale levels. On a color, we still can differentiate something. But what spectrum on each pixel can give us? It can give us information on the chemical composition. It can give us information about water concentration or any other thing which make a difference in a spectrum. Uh, there are several techniques how to obtain the hyperspectral uh, data. And those are scanning techniques where we can perform a line scanning through the cube and then by that respectively acquire the whole spectrum, but on one spatial line. And then scanning through the object, recollect the complete uh, hyperspectral cube. We can also make a scan on a point scan spectrometer. Effectively, that way we need to scan the whole object, again, to recollect the data. Or it can be wavelength scanning, when on each snapshot we are obtaining one slice through the hyperspectral cube. So what are the advantages of those me scanning methods? It's a definitely high number of spectral bands, yeah, because we're effectively not really limited by that, uh, only by the construction of the device. What is the disadvantage? Of course. So we are scanning, so object needs to be static. We cannot do that on the fly. 
Oh, another technique how to obtain the hyperspectral data is to split it into multiple 2D elements, right? So by certain methods, so a few words about that later, and then recombine the hyperspectral cube again. So advantages. We can do that in one single snapshot. Disadvantages, we don't have that many spectral bands. So the today's state of the art of hyperspectral imaging is using several techniques for obtaining the hyperspectral data. And those can be divided into four basic methods. So the one, which is uh, wavelength scanning, so where we, by certain mean or tool, can make a, a filter on in front of the camera and acquire only one particular wavelength. So then we can do a spatial scan, right? So when we can have a prism, which creates a effectively making a slit prism, and then we have a spectral image on the 2D sensor. And then so there was a time scan where it uses Fourier transform to obtain, so which is more complicated to describe it in a few minutes, and as well some combination methods. So if everything is so great, why we are not seeing hyperspectral cameras in each and every application? There are certain obstacles, right? So to make this technology widely deployed. And some of them are named here, right? So it's uh, usually a very complicated optical device, which includes different prism optical filters, which needs to be perfectly aligned to each other, which needs to be calibrated. Uh, yeah, so because of that, it's, it's fragile as any other complex optical device. It's expensive as a consequence of all of that, heavy and uh, difficult to customize, and so on. <laughs> so. The revolution which comes from iMac is effectively the idea, what if instead of doing some changes to the optical path, we can adjust the sensor properties that it will be sensitive only at certain particular wavelengths. Similar like to red, green, blue, so Bayern pattern of the sensor, right? but having more bands. And the way how to do that is to build uh, or manufacture in semiconductor process, fabric pair filter on top of each pixel. OK, so and now it's not a dream, it's re reality. So such sensors exist. And uh, as of today, there are three types of those sensors, those structures which are um, built on top of uh, the CMOS sensor. Uh, that is one which is kind of stages, steps, wage design, line scan. It's a different type of line scan from the one which we uh, saw previously, because that one actually has a spatial resolution. But each particular part of the sensor has a certain wavelength. The other type of sensor is a snapshot mosaic. That one is much closer to Bayan pattern, where there is a certain macro pixel composed from uh, pixel sensitive at certain wavelengths. And then there is a snapshot tile uh, where the sensor is divided into uh, areas, and each particular area is sensitive at certain wavelengths. So a few more words about the line scan. So that is a, how it looks like, right? So there is a uh, hundred, more than 100 bands. Each band has a eight pixels on its height. And then parameters of each filter is um, it's a full width half maximum between 10 to 15 uh, nanometers. And spatial resolution, which is effectively that one. So it's 2,048 pixels and 100 bands across the height. So what we can get out of this sensor is effectively 1,360 lines per second. And it's important to understand that if we will remind the hyperspectral cube, it's effectively it's a diagonal cut through the hyperspectral cube, where each particular spatial line contributes to a particular part of the hyperspectral cube at its respective wavelength. The uh, snapshot mosaic type of uh, sensor, uh, the one which you can see at our booth uh, C51 here, so it is even um, more number of uh, bands. So the one which is also available is 4x4 four four visible light. So another one is 5x5 uh, five five near infrared. So a few words about that later. And so how it is organized. So similar, as I said, to bind pattern, you have a patch with those filters, 
ranged from uh, 470 to 630 nanometers. And then, yeah, so what we can out, get out of that, yeah, so again, if we will recover the hyperspectral cube, it's a sparse sampling of the cube. So because for each particular x, y coordinate, we have only one sample in terms of the wavelength. OK? And then what we need to do, similar to uh, bind pattern um, post-processing, it's uh, interpolation of the data to get a complete hyperspectral cube. Uh, the last one is a snapshot tiled where it has uh, patches of sensitive at, uh, against certain wavelengths distributed across the sensor area. In order to provide the imaging on such a sensor, what is required is an optical duplicator. It's an optical device which is having the multiple focus points and creating the similar image on all those tiles. And so the biggest advantage is that we have very dense spatial information yeah, because of each pixel in imaging. So the number of bands for this sensor is 32 bands. And again, so we can get 170 hyperspectral cubes per second. So from single shot, we are building one hyperspectral cube. So here's a table with the models and the availability. So the one which we were discussing first, so it's a line scan, it's available now. So the snapshot mosaic with 470 to 630 is available now. The one which is 5 by 5, 600 to 1,000. So that is coming now. So it's not really yet available. So it requires some uh, calibration qualification of the, that. And then a uh, snapshot tile uh, with 600 to 1,000 is also available now. There are some more sensors in pipeline. And what is important to mention, that technology allows to create any required pattern of filters. It can be pseudo-random. It can be different wavelengths. So all of that, again, available on the um, standard CMOS sensors. Yeah, I forgot to mention, those are based on CMOS's CMV2000 sensors. So and that is how our hyperspectral camera looks like. So it is really, really tiny. So it is a one cubic inch overall dimension. So it weighs less than 30 grams. It consumes less than 1.8 watt. So what you can do with all of that, you can put it into any compact device, whether it is flying or moving, and get the hyperspectral data from the places where you hardly can bring the regular hyperspectral imaging device. Yeah, so the cameras by their nature sup are supported by the all reasonable operating systems as well as uh, uh, different uh, processor architectures and embedded platforms. And now some interesting part is coming. Okay, so if everything again is so good, so why we can't use it just now, just today? Because there is one big question. Okay, we're getting a lot of data from hyperspectral camera. But can we really directly use that data? I mean, it's even not an image. It's a 3D data. Yeah, so what we do with that? But don't get scared. So there is an answer for that. So, uh, so just figures, right? So you can follow. So 309 digits, just to represent the possible values for each individual pixel in hyperspectral image. So what we do with all of that data yeah, so it's still not information which we can use, again, to identify whether uh, there is a skin disease, whether our crop is ready for harvesting, or many other things. So what we need, we need a smart software to reduce complexity and dimensionality of this data. So how it is done, and that is, uh, there, are, there is a whole science behind it. It's uh, research which is done by many different academic institutions for decades starting from the very first applications I think about 30 years ago and then specifically for remote sensing and now spread into all application areas mentioned in the beginning. So what is a regular workflow for the hyperspectral camera? 
it's quite generic, yeah? so it's not dives into fine details, which are definitely there. But effectively, what we need to do, we need to acquire hyperspectral cube. Yeah, so the thing which we discussed in the beginning. Then what we need to do, we need to identify some spectra. Again, so complete uh, new area. So each particular substance or material has its own spectra. So which we can use just to apply that to the pixel and say whether it correlates or whether it is the same or not. And by this way to get uh, so-called chemical imaging to identify substances. Or if we have a sample which represents particular properties of the um, object, we can collect uh, reference spectra and then apply it to see whether it is correlates or coincides or not. So after spectral selection, what we need to do, we need to apply these uh, individual spectra to each and every pixel on our half spectral cube and see to which particular spectra this particular pixel relates most. As the outcome of that, so we are getting the pseudo colored image, which shows the correlation to those spectra of each pixels. What we need to do, we need to validate whether the things which we are seeing corresponds to what we want to get out of, the, out of that uh, setup. And finally, what we can do after verifying that this uh, method works for our samples, we can really differentiate things at the very beginning of the presentation, whether it is a bruise on the apple or it's just a leaf, right? Because for regular camera, you hardly can distinguish that. So in validating that it works, we can apply the whole processing chain yeah, from that to the new hyperspectral cubes which can be acquired in real time. And by that, providing the real-time answer on the, on the question. So uh, there are two companies which we are cooperating with, specifically involved purely in uh, hyperspectral imaging things and data processing. One which is located in Graz, Austria, so Perception Park. They have a um, nice software, so one slides later on. Uh, which the focus of their software is uh, chemical color imaging. So that is what I mentioned. So knowing the spectra for particular substances, we can say what particular chemicals are present on the same. Um, it, it integrates with the existing processing pipeline in a way that uh, instead of delivering hyperspectral cube, which no one can process, so the output of that software is a uh, 2D images with a pseudo color or some indexes of substances or indexes of uh, spectra. And then, so th what it uh, allows is to substantially reduce the development time to get your hyperspectral system up and running. The other company located in Canberra in Australia, so the uh, system name is Scalarus. And uh, that is a bit different approach, but solving exactly the same task. So to find in the relation between the known spectra, having a library of known spectra, and applying that to unknown image. Uh, that is um, uh, one of the uh, differences is that this software can um, identify elimination and separate that from the complete analysis, leaving the only reflectance as a subject for, for making the decision. Available as a library, available as a standalone application, and as a MATLAB uh, plugin. So that is a screenshot from the Apple with Bruce, where you can really hardly see the Bruce here, right? But by differentiating it in spectral, so you can see it's it's clearly here. So the uh, the if you would like to see how that is working. So you can see that at our booth where it is. This software with our cameras is running. So example of uh, Skyman from Skillaris. So the same approach with the different modifications, but including the library for Spectras. OK, so that's it. So if you have any questions, so I would better ask those questions rather than